But that can be reconstituted. It doesn't matter if they died last week or if they died 2,000 years ago. God's going to be able to put them all back together. What do you think? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely, He can put them all back together. And as He puts them back together, verse 17, Then you which are alive or made shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort yeah. one another with these words. Okay? That's the rapture, isn't it? Well, that is turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I wonder if this is a timeline. It's a very simple version of this. Okay? This that was so much information. If you haven't already copied this, by the way, into your notepad someplace, that's why it's sitting up here. I'm going to erase it right now so I have more room to work. Praise for you. Yeah, brave man. Okay, so this is a timeline. I was taught this back in 1990, the very first time that I ever heard Life and Vision. This was how they drew it out, and so I've always tried to copy it because that's how I did it. And it, it was under Pastor Tim Paul over in Fort Walton Beach, Florida. And I hope this is good enough to see in the back. But that's the cross, okay? The cross of Jesus Christ. Then we've got over here. Jesus Christ coming back from heaven's glory into the clouds. The dead in Christ shall rise first. Okay? So you've got the dead in Christ shall rise first. So all these people that are in the graves that are saved are going to be reconstituted and their spirit and their soul will come back from heaven. Their body will turn into a glorious body, fashioned like unto his glorious body, and they'll meet up in the air. And at the same time, all these people who are on earth are going to be raptured out. Then, a seven-year time period. Now, I'm not, I'm not staunch on this part. This seven-year tribulation is seven years. But I don't know that it starts the very second to the clock starts taking the very second the rapture happens. There could be some time between the rapture and the starting of the seven year time period. That's all of that's Gilbertology. So that don't matter. But the seven year tribulation is a fact, isn't it? Yes. Seven year tribulation period where a whole bunch of crazy stuff is going to go on on this earth. And I won't be here. What about you? Not going to be here. Because we're going to be raptured out. We're going to be the Lord in the air and then we're going to be caught up into heaven. There'll be a seven year time period called the rapture or called the tribulation period. The second half is called the great tribulation. And then of course Jesus Christ will come back all the way to earth. Notice the first arrow goes into the clouds. The second arrow comes all the way back to earth. And then there'll be a thousand year reign of Jesus Christ and eternity following after that. That's a real simple timeline. We're living in a time that's after the cross, but before the rapture. And I want to talk to you about this time period in here right now. Because this is the most important time period. I was told a long time ago, the most important name in the whole world is your own. And I thought, that's pretty smart. But when I try and learn, when I get somebody's name, I try and learn it correctly, the way they pronounce it. You know, like, my name is Gilbert. But if you pronounce it Gilbert, it would sound funny to me. Or if you called me Gil, I'd be... That's a part of a fish. Gil. The only people... My wife doesn't call me Gil. The only people on planet Earth that call me Gil are my family back home. My mom, my dad, and my older brothers and older sisters. They still call me Gil. But I take it from them because that's how I grew up. I was a little kid, right? But your name is the most important name in the whole world to you. The most important name in the whole world in reality is Jesus Christ, isn't it? Amen. You have to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ in order to go to heaven. You have to be saved. Second Corinthians chapter 5. I want to talk just for a few minutes here about why we're here. Especially, Jan did such a good job talking about the gospel that I want to, and it was like perfect because I thought I was going to be first up today. But I'm second up, and Rhonda goes, man, that was perfect. Jan's message was perfect, so you follow that. 
that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Why? See, I like to ask that question, why? And I ask it a lot when I read my Bible. I'll just ask, why? Now, usually there's no one around to hear me, so it's okay. But like when you're in a store and you're reading and you go, why? People start to look at you. Okay, so I just, I just start doing my Bible study at home. When you're in the store. Okay. But I say, why? Why? Well, because we're ambassadors. Present your body as a living sacrifice. A sacrifice is something that's killed. It's something that's killed in offering to the Lord. We're to be a living sacrifice. We're to live so that we can bring honor and glory to the Lord Jesus Christ. Right? Amen. It says, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your extraordinary <coughs> service. It doesn't say that. You say, I mean, you start beating your chest and say, Yeah, but I pass out tracks. Yeah, but I witness to people. Yeah. That's your reasonable service. Where is Joe? Joe's right there. He's got on his Marine. He's a former Marine. So you, ask, you ask those guys when they're at war. You ask them, you say, well, hey, the guy got two purple hearts and he ended up losing a leg. And you know what the, the guy in charge is going to say? Yeah, so he was doing his job. And we're just doing our job. You're supposed to be witnessing to people if you're saved. Now, if you're not saved, get that taken care of. But once you're saved, you're supposed to be witnessing. That's a part of being a happy Christian. Is sharing the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at the next verse. It's going to give you some tips on how to. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good. And, remember I said, and means there's more than one thing. Good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Maybe you're not good enough to witness to be perfect. Maybe you're not good enough to witness to where it comes out where you're acceptable. But maybe you're just good. Won't that do it? Man, just witness. You can't witness wrong. I remember Jerry one time said, he said, uh, there's a lot of guys that can preach the gospel better than me, but nobody can preach a better gospel than me. And that's the truth. If you have the gospel down, and if you're saved, then you better know how you got that way. Because if I ask you, are you saved? And you say, yes, sir. And I say, how'd you get that way? And you don't know. The indication is you're not saved. I mean, you've got a lot of desserts over here. And I say, did you make those brownies? I sure did. How'd you make them? Here is the 
of thy love and faith, which thou hast toward the Lord Jesus and toward all saints, that the communication of thy faith may become effectual, effective, may become effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. What did they do? By name it was a soul winner. And Paul said, I pray for you all the time that you could be a more effective soul winner. That when you communicate the Lord Jesus Christ, people will understand and they'll accept it. That's what we're called to do. That's our reasonable service. So let's ask a couple of questions. Do you have a burden for lost souls? I mean, really do. And it's okay if you say, no, I, I, I really don't. And that's fine. But you need to pray that you'll get a burden for lost souls. Okay. When I was saved, I was six years old. And I was in, and the fact that I got saved in this church is phenomenal. My sister and I got saved on the same Sunday morning. We went to Sunday school, and, and normally we had you know, a number of kids in the Sunday school, but this week, the only person I showed up was me and my sister Lee. And that's not her real name either. That's just a short name. We go by like Gail and Lee. So we were in Sunday school. And the teacher said, well, we're not going to do the flannel board and stuff like that today. We're going to do a little bit different. And I said, okay, great. And she said, let me ask you a question. If you had the choice to go to heaven or go to hell, which one do you want to go to? <laughs> you remember this one when you hold your arm up? And think of something you couldn't hold up in here. Yes. We're all sinners. I said, okay. Got that. 
And if there's a price to pay for sin, and that price is hell. Okay. So that is what the world told me hell, right? She said, no, I, I told you there's four things. You're on two. And so, okay. She says, the third thing you have to understand is that Jesus Christ already paid that price in your stead. He already paid the price that you should have paid, and that you should be paying, and that you will pay if you're not saved. So Jesus Christ, and this course goes on to Jesus Christ dying on the cross for us and the cool scriptures. He was buried, he rose on the third day according to the scriptures. She shows me in the Bible. And I go, okay, I, that makes sense then. So Jesus Christ died in my place. So it's just like when I was supposed to get in trouble from my dad and go talk to the manager. Jesus Christ stepped in to my dad and said, I'll go in his place. And I said, okay, that makes sense. So, so we're all going to heaven. And she said, no, I told you there's four things. You're on number three. Okay, let's get this right there. That didn't tell you I was a bright kid. But I was bright enough that when I heard the gospel for the very first time in my life, I got saved. I, just, I know that everybody has a different testimony of salvation. And I'm telling you mine because that's what you should do to other people is tell them your testimony of salvation. Amen, brother. Okay? Everybody's testimony is different. So I asked her, okay, so one, we're a sinner. Got it. Two, there's a price to pay for being a sinner, and that's death and hell. Got it. Three, Jesus Christ already paid that price. And she said, number four, you have to personally accept and trust what Jesus did for you in order to get saved. You have to say that if nobody else had lived on the whole entire planet Earth, that Jesus Christ still would have come down to that cross 2,000 years ago and died personally for you. And I accepted Christ as my Savior, and I trusted that gospel the very first time I heard it. Now, that doesn't make me special. It just makes me not dumb. <laughs> when you hear a good deal, you take it, right? In 1990, the first time I was ever presented with this chart and by the vision, I said, I raised my hand during the class, and I said, let me get this right. You're saying, and I asked him questions about the lesson that he was teaching. And he said, yes. And I go, can you prove that? And he goes, yeah, turn over to. And we went over there. And I'm like, okay, got it. See, all I had to know was, I was told for a little boy that there is a God. You're not him. And he wrote a book. And it's the perfect King James Bible. So I didn't have a lot to go on. But I knew that there was a perfect book. Because God wrote it. It had to be perfect. That makes sense, right? And that there's a perfect place to go, and that's heaven, and I wanted to go there. Someone showed me how to go to heaven, and I took that. Now look over at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We just talked about it, but I can see everybody starting to get drowsy. By the way, I forgot to tell you my two jokes. Now, Gary, you haven't heard these two. Oh, good. He says those are good. You haven't heard these two jokes. Okay. What is, what animal? And it's not human. Right? What animal has the highest blood pressure? What? So look at First Corinthians 15. What animal has the highest blood pressure? What did you say? Giraffe. Giraffe. Get it? The highest blood pressure? No. <laughs> I said there were going to be two jokes. I didn't say they'd be good jokes. I don't get paid enough for that. Okay, and then the second one is why do gorillas my wife loves this one. Why do gorillas have such wide nostrils? It's science. Why do gorillas have such wide nostrils? Because they have such fat fingers. So that's my point. That's the science, folks. Believe the science. Follow the science. Which I preached unto you. So we know that the gospel is something that's preached. Right? Amen. Which I preached unto you. Which also have received. So we know it's something that's received. Like when I was six. And where you stand. So I know the gospel is something that's preached. That I have to receive. And I can stand on it. But it's also your stay. Okay? So I know the gospel is something that I receive. That I can stand on, and I know that it gets me saved. By which also you're saved, 
if, now if is a very small word with a very big meaning. You get on the wrong side of if and you're in trouble. Right? So if, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you believe in vain. So I know the gospel is something that I can believe in vain. What does that in vain mean? It means it of no use. So you, you believe the fact that Jesus Christ lived on the earth. You believe the fact that he died on the cross at 33. You believe that he was buried. You believe that he rose again the third day. The Pope believes all that too. You know who else believes that? Satan. Satan. But he's not saved, is he? You have to believe it, but not believe it in vain, of no use. See, I believed it for a purpose. I didn't want to go to hell, and I did want to go to heaven. So I believed it and I trusted it for myself. It says, verse 3, and here's the gospel. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received on the road to Damascus. How that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. You see, that's the whole point. Are you saved? Do you know how to get saved? If you are saved and you know how to get saved, then you know how to tell somebody else how to get saved, and you might say, yeah, but you know, that's easy for you. You guys are all preachers and you're able to get up here and talk in front of a bunch of people. My wife, I, this is only to right now. This is the third sermon I've done in the last three years. Well, yesterday was the second sermon I've done in the last three years. And she asked me right before I went up, she said, are you nervous? Because she'd been asking for like three days, are you nervous? And I said, no, but I might get nervous right before I go. So right before I got up yesterday, she said, are you nervous? I said, no. You're in that. But if I ask one of you guys to get up and stand up here and preach, some of you are wrong. You're already starting to get like that beard a little bit. He's not going to do that, is he? <laughs> no. Now, Russ used to fly planes for a living. You won't catch me getting behind a big giant machine that goes up in the air, and I don't know how to fly myself? No. If I can't fly, I don't want to be going up in the air on a daily basis for a living. The odds of crashing is increased greatly. Do you think he thought about that all the time? I hope he did. I hope every time he strapped it, he didn't say, well, okay, one more shot. <laughs> 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 it's my <laughs> Put on your knees, though, please. <laughs> no. See, everybody does a different, it's a different personality. Everybody can do something different, right? You don't have to be a preacher to preach the gospel. You don't have to be a preacher to witness to people. I'm going to give you some easy ways to do write, write these down to for yourself because they might be some things you never thought of. Now, you, there is no, no end to how many ways you can present the gospel. But you find what's good for you. But the main thing is, do you care about lost souls who are going to hell? Do you care enough about lost souls to witness to them? See, I do Uber driving. I have 6,005 rides under my belt. That's a lot of people, right? Well, as soon as the door opens, I wait for an opportunity to get a good tip. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, I do that too. <laughs> but I also wait for an opportunity to share with them the gospel. And it's an easy way to get the conversation started. If, if we're friendly and we're going and it's a longer trip and they're talking about life and stuff like that, you know, asking about different things, and then I'll just say, tell me about your religious background. Now that's something anybody can ask, right? That's not saying, are you saying <laughs> <laughs> Well, show me how you got that way. <laughs> no. I just say, tell me about your religious background. I learned this from a Baptist preacher who asked me when I went to visit his church. He said, Tell me about your religious background. That was a way for me to open up about what kind of churches I went to. And I ultimately told them, well, when I was six, I got saved from the Free Methodist Church. I don't know how because, you know, I told the story I just told you. So I said, tell me about your religious background. And they'll always open up. I've never asked anybody ever get mad about that. They'll always say, well, uh, we didn't really go to church. Okay, well, I know what I'm dealing with. 
a lost person that hasn't been convinced of a whole bunch of children, right? <laughs> and there's going to be an easier canvas to work with. Or they'll always say, they'll say, well, my mom used to take us to this, this little country church, uh, and I'm like, oh, what kind was it? Um, you know, I don't remember. Okay. No matter what they say, you're going to go, okay, great. Because you're, it's not a confrontation. Tell me about your religious background. You know, but, oh, you know, but we used to go to a Baptist church. And uh, I hated that picture. Oh, really? Why? What happened? Oh, he was always making go to sleep, or, or he was always screaming at us and telling us we're all going to hell. And then you go, oh, okay. <laughs> 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 so you want to know where they're coming from, right? My job is to get them to here, but I got to know where they're coming from first. Now, if they tell me that they, they dealt with Baptists and they can't stand them, then I'm not going to go on and sound like a Baptist. <laughs> if they go, oh, we have a Pentecostal background, and in America I was, I was baptized when I was only seven years old, I spoke in tongues for the first time when I was 16, and um, I, I did this, and I did that, and I used to teach at, uh, at, our, uh, at Bible conferences for the Pentecostal church. Well, I know I'm dealing with someone who's very religious, right? So I need to know how to approach her. So that's the easy way to do it. But well, what's up even easier than that? No matter what type of personality you have, you can win souls if you're willing to do the work. Does that make sense? If you're willing to do the work. How about using your hobbies? You say, I don't have any hobbies. Well, get a hobby. <laughs> you know what I mean? Get a hobby. If you have a hobby, then use that hobby so that you can win souls. Well, how do I do that? Have trash with you. I love how these gentlemen here have made up their own tracks. They didn't like the tracks they were finding, so they made up their own, right? Excellent. So they keep those with you. Or there's about a gazillion different tracks on Google. You just Google gospel tracks. Google 25 ways to go to heaven. And there'll be tracks all over the place. You can look, if you find someone gives you a track, or you find a track on the bottom or the back, it'll tell you where it came from, like Gospel Fellowship or whatever. Go to these websites, look them up. They'll have tracks that you can read the whole thing from the back before you ever order, and they're only about 10 cents a piece. Get some tracks. And what do you do with them? All you have to do is hang them out. Now, if I'm talking to somebody and they're very religious, like I had this man the other day, he said that he was... Grew up in the Catholic Church. He was well in his 80s. He said he grew up in the Catholic Church. He um, taught over there and volunteered over at the Catholic Church of St. Mary's or whatever for 40 plus years. I asked him which church. He said St. Mary's. And I said, okay, awesome. I didn't say, oh, that means you're going to hell. <laughs> oh. no. I said, oh, awesome. And then as he got out, I handed him a track. And I said, hey, here's my favorite Bible verses. I mean, it's true. Every Bible verse is my favorite. Here's my favorite Bible verses. You being so religious, you'll love these. He goes, thanks. He goes, I wish we could get more people to love God in this day. We need more God in this age. And I said, boy, I'm right there with you, brother. Sneak attack, huh? And do you think he's going to have to read that? Yes. Yeah. Use your hobbies. If you golf. Wouldn't it be great? And I don't golf. I only golfed one time in my whole life, and I shot an 81. And they said that was true. They said that was excellent, but I never got to the back nine. Otherwise, I really could have done good. But that is true story. So 81 and 9 holes took forever. Can you imagine if you go to the club, and all of a sudden you go, what is that? What's sticking out of it? There's a track in this hole. You would probably read it just out of curiosity, wouldn't you? What a great way to pepper tracks in a golf course. <laughs> How about you ever go to a library? No. You pick up a book off of any shelf, you open it up, and you stick a track in there, and you stick it right back in. Did you ever think about that? Why not? You can get out of a hundred tracks in about ten minutes and no one will ever bother you and you don't have to be the type of personality that will talk to any stranger. 
And it might take three years before all those tracks are found. But eventually they'll get checked out, right? <laughs> so books, if you're a fisherman, you can talk to people about Jesus. And I heard this one guy talk about being fishers for men. How are you doing today? <laughs> Sports events, your interest. How about this? Who here gets bills in the mail? Because I don't use checks to pay my bills. I just do it online. Maybe you do the same thing. Either whether you pay with a check or pay online, it doesn't matter. That little envelope, if you look at it, it says postage paid. You ever thought about putting a track in there? Somebody has to open that. When they, when they get out of the other end, somebody, they don't have a machine that opens up those things. Or those advertisements, every day junk mail, right? If you get bills, you get junk mail. You're going to get more junk mail than you get bills. Of course. So take those bills, or those junk mails, and they always have an envelope that says, postage paid. Open it up, stick a track, link it, or seal it, and put it in the mailbox. And now you can send out 50 tracks a week without ever leaving your house. <laughs> and some human will have to open that at some point. Now, I'm not saying that you take a big box of rocks and you put the thing to your house and then you may have one track inside the box of rocks. Don't be mean about it. But one track inside the network is perfect. You use your circumstances. Use your God-given talents. Use your running around. When you're at the gas station, we have to pay for gas. Um, we were paying with cash instead of the card. No one just swiped a debit card. But we had a bunch of cash we wanted to use on the road trip, so we had to go inside. Well, why wouldn't it be easy after I get the change or as I pay it up just to say something like simple as, hey, here's my favorite Bible verses for you, or that means I gotta stop. Here's my favorite Bible verses for you, or another way to say it is, here's something for you to read when you get a chance. See, no one ever gets mad about that. Here's something for you to read when you get a chance. So those two phrases, hey, what's your religious background? Or what church did you grow up in? They'll tell you if they grew up in church or didn't grow up in church or whatever. Now you've got a conversation started. So hopefully that gives you a few ideas on how to get gospel tracks in people's hands. Walmart, the library, shopping centers, when you get your hair cut, when you visit sick people. I like those tracks that look like money and you leave them on a bench and a bar or something like that. People say, I'm doing it over And I like it because it tricked me one time when I was in the Thank you for your time. <laughs>